Hi, this is Linda Hitt. We're going to look at <clears throat> debts today, those that are due within a year or less from the balance sheet date. These could be short-term liabilities like notes payable, accounts payable, or it could be a long-term liability that is now due in its last year. Or something like a mortgage payment could actually be split between short-term and long-term. If something, you know, whatever portion is due within 12 months. Accounts payable is probably your most um, commonly thought of short-term debt. Very short-term, um, often end of the month or a certain number of days. Um, it doesn't deal with interest normally. If you're past due, of course, you may have a late fee or interest or penalty. Um, discounts could be offered if it's paid quickly or you have a large order. And normally it's just a, coming about from normal business transactions. Notes payable comes about usually if you go to borrow money from the bank or a credit institution of some kind. Um, this tends to be a formal debt instrument. The person borrowing the money issues the note um, to the person giving the money. Um, interest rates are often quoted as annual rates. Um, and we'll see that interest is not recorded when you first take the note out. However, when you do your statements, you, you're going to have to accrue interest on it if it's not paid yet. And then, of course, at the end, you also deal with interest. Um, the calculation we'll be seeing is taking your principal amount of the loan times the interest rate, which is usually shown as an annual rate, times time, which can be number of days over 360 or number of days over 365 or number of months over 12. Payroll will be one major issue we'll look at. Um, we'll be dealing with three separate journal entries. The first one we'll look at is simply recording the employee costs for the gross pay. It'll have all the withholdings and then the net pay will be what we actually pay the employee. Um, depressing as it may be, sometimes there's not a whole lot at the end. So we'll, this will really look like a giant accrued expense with one or two expense accounts debited and then a whole bunch of payables or liabilities withholdings credited. Um, and then if we do pay the payroll, we'll be paying the employees. Um, other entries that we'll be doing for payroll, the employer is responsible for paying payroll taxes, so they will match certain employee taxes um, they will also deal with unemployment, FUDA and SUDA. So we'll see this as, again, a giant <laughs> accrued expense. And then if, you're, if the company offers fringe benefits of some kind to the employees, sick leave, annual leave, um, contributing to retirement, life insurance, health insurance, we'll also have a separate entry for that. And these costs or fringe benefits could be anywhere from 25 to 50 percent or more. Um, of the gross pay, which can, so they can be significant. Sales tax is something that we sometimes must think of as a sales tax expense, but it's really not our expense. We're collecting money from the customer and turning right around and paying that to the government, or we're billing the customer who will then pay us and we'll turn it over. So it's really sales tax payable, which is why it's in this chapter. Um, it's remitted frequently to the government, um, so we set it up when we bill the customer or collect, and then we pay it to the government. Warranties, um, if you offer any type of special deal where you either give money back um, if they are not satisfied or you're going to repair and fix an appliance over some period of time, um, this is tr we, we try to estimate this. It's again dealing with that matching principle that you have a revenue that was generated um, with the warranty attached to it, and now we need to show an expense. So even though the warranty could be a one-year, two-year, five-year warranty, we're not going to expense it as we repair or fix. We're going to try to bring it into the current period and match it up with the revenue that created the problem in the first place. So we'll see it's very few journal entries for that. And then last, we'll do the contingent liabilities, which um, are things that something has happened and there's um, a possibility, either a low possibility or a high possibility, that you will lose money in the future because of this event that has already happened. Um, the language we use, and accountants have the little buzzwords too, but 
three different levels. Probable is the highest level, and we will assume that whoever estimated this, very likely. Reasonably possible um, could happen, but could also not happen, so it's not likely, or not as likely as probable. And then remote is very unlikely. So usually you need to recognize something with a probable event. Um, the other thing we have to be able to do is can we estimate it um, with either one number or a series or range of numbers? Is it something that's very expensive for us compared to our other expenses and losses? So is it material, which means large enough to be worthwhile to actually put on your statements? Or is it small? In which case nobody cares about it and you don't need to put anything else on your statements as we all know there's enough. So do nothing, you're pretty safe to assume if it's remote, do nothing. If it's not material, do nothing. Um, if it's probable and material and you can estimate it, then you're going to journalize it. So that's like the highest level where all the variables kind of fit. Then if it's reasonably possible, probably a footnote, um, or it's probable and you can't estimate it, footnote it. When you get down again to remote, do nothing. Okay, so let's see if we can take a look at our problem today. Um, where we'll again get to journalize and look at the impact on the statements. Um, all about liabilities. So the first one is just basically borrowing $12,000 cash from the bank. 5% um, interest rate is charged. It's a one-year note. No interest is dealt with first. So we're just going to pick up the cash coming in and we'll have the notes payable. And we only deal with the principal when we first start. It's very different types of notes and this is the type we just simply enter that. So we see more resources. We have more liabilities. <laughs> and that's the balance sheet impact. Then we get over to net income. It will not deal with that till we have an interest cost. And then cash flow. Cash is coming in, but of course it's not ours to keep, so it's going to be financing. Not sure why it did flow, but anyway. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. And next we paid off last month's sales tax payable. So on December 4th we paid $800. And if we do that, then <clears throat> we've already set it up. So sales tax payable, the liability is going down, and we are simply reducing cash. Okay, so any payment of a liability should reduce your assets, reduce your liabilities. Um, nothing about expenses or revenues, so no income statement stuff, and the cash outflow Sales tax works right with your customer transactions, part of your day-to-day -day doing business. So in this case, this one would fit with operating. Okay, we borrowed money from the bank just to give you some variety of different notes. Um, again, the borrowing itself is pretty straightforward. We record the principal. This one's quoted in days, so we'll see something a little different with the um, interest that we have later. Um, I'm not going to deal with the impact because it's the same impact as the first. Um, next we sold some merchandise and we have sales tax on that sale. Um, the merchandise costs 4000 So normally, if you remember, we would have debited cash and credited sales or sales revenue for the full amount, but with sales tax we add an extra piece. So we are going to collect from the customer $7,000 plus the 5%. So 5% on 7,000 is 350. 350 plus 7,000 is 7,350. Okay, so that's what we're collecting. But we didn't earn $350. It's not ours to keep. So our sales revenue is actually going to be 7,000, the invoice price of the goods. So you can see we, we need $350 on the credit side to get this thing to balance and that's where sales tax payable comes in. Um, again, it's not our money to keep. We take it from the customer, turn it right around and give it to the government. So it is a compound entry. 
and the second part of it is um, using up the inventory. So you might remember cost of goods sold, which is an expense, just to remind us. Um, and we have a cost of four thousand, and then merchandise inventory, or simply inventory. Okay, but what we will deal with first is with the sales tax, and let's put the numbers in. Um, we see that we have more resources by the full amount, and sales tax payable goes up by 350. That's a positive. And then sales revenue is a retained earnings account with closings that goes into stockholders' equity. So that's how we balance the balance sheet. Two equity items on the right side of the equation and then the total on the left balances out. Um, so we're looking at just the first entry, no impact on, yeah, excuse me, we do have an impact on the income statement. Whoa! <laughs> sales revenue would cause profits to go up, and then our cash, $73.50, cash inflow, um, definitely operations, day-to-day -day stuff. And I should put here, let's see. Um, and then your cost of goods sold, if you remember, <clears throat> you have less inventory, so your assets go down. You have cost of goods sold expense, closing into retained earnings, so stockholders equity goes down. Um, your profits are less, everything's going down, but there's no cash outflow. So you can see that the um, income statement is impacted by the gross profit, revenues, less expenses there. Okay, next we borrowed more money. You're going to wonder when we're going to stop borrowing money here, but again, just to give you a couple of variety of entries, um, it's the usual cash and notes payable and no interest dealing. Okay, December 15th, we have a note that was signed last month that matures this month. So we have to assume we're doing monthly statements, monthly adjusting entries. We assume that we've already done the interest last month. So what amount of interest would have been accrued? It would have been principal. Um, if it was taken out December, November 15th, there's, let's look at that first. There's 30 days in November. So 30 days minus the 15th, because you don't count the first day. There's 15 days of interest in November. And then, of course, December, another 15 days. So it's exactly split. So if we take, we've already recognized interest for the first half. So we take 1,200 principal times the interest rate, which is 10%. That's 120 per year, but this is not per year. So we're going to pick up 15 days over 360. That's five dollars. Okay, so five dollars was already recognized, and then we want to pick up five dollars. So maybe here we'll use the sticky note <laughs> to do um, interest expense from last, or interest payable rather. We would have done closing entries from last time. So interest payable last time for November was five, and then we need to recognize interest for this month which is another five. So we have five. Okay, so let's recognize the interest for this month, which is interest expense and interest payable. Again, a lot of accrued expenses in this check, in this section. Um, and we said it was five for December. Okay, so what we assume then is that if we did a ledger, and I'll just do it this way, um, we would have already had five dollars from last time. You just imagine that's on the credit side. We then added five dollars for this time. So this is again, this is interest payable is the ledger count. So with two credits, if we had a line going this way, um, so we really have interest payable of $10 at this point. So when I make the payment, I'm going to have yeah, um, interest payable, notes payable, and cash. So we have $10 because we have last month's five and this month's five. Notes payable was originally $1,200. 
and the cash should be the combination of the two. Other than the fact that I didn't spell interest correctly, hopefully that's all right. Okay, so that's a lot going on there. The accrual of interest is, again, that is an accrued expense, so what you would expect is not that. <laughs> Your liabilities are going to go up. Your um, stockholders' equity goes down because of an expense closing to retain earnings. Your profit goes down, and that's it. And then paying your loan here, you're reducing your cash, you're reducing your liability for the total, and you have no impact on your profits this time around, and your cash outflow is interest and note. So here we got to think about this. Um, your no interest payable payment will be going against operating. O for operating, whoops, <laughs> and your notes payable, which is minus the 1200, is actually going against financing. I'll put the F there temporarily. Um, yeah, I could move it up. Let me move it up so you can see it better. Operating minus 1200 and then we can do financing there. Okay, that's better. And I'll take that one out. Okay, so don't forget when you have them repay a note, the principal is financing the interest, which relates to interest expense, is operating. All cash paid for expenses is operating. Okay, then we have repairing merchandise that we sold um, earlier. The actual repairs are going to go against the liability, which probably was set up last period and other periods. Um, but by the end of the period, we'll do an adjusting entry to update the warranty. So it doesn't really matter which comes first before you do your financial statements. You will have accrued the warranty. But when you make repairs, just simply reduce the liability and cash, or I guess if it's parts, you know, parts inventory or something like that. So assets and liabilities go down for cash outflow. I think we could say that this is definitely part of your day-to-day -day operations. Okay, so now we're into payroll. Um, so what I've done over here, we have two employees. We've got Tim Lewis, who's brand new, hired this month in December. And then we have Anna Dunlap, who's worked a number of years for us. And we have all their information here. <clears throat> Notice that, that Anna makes 10000 a month. And her cumulative pay, which means we're on a calendar year basis, so from January to November, um, if you just think about that, if it's 10000 a month times 11 months have already passed, or the end, that's where we get the 110000 And then, of course, she would have the 10000 for this month, which would give her a total for the year of 120. So we're going to do the payroll entry for just the month. These people are paid monthly. I thought it would be easier rather than try to bring it from there, to the data to the transactions, to actually give you a little chart. So I bring, brought the numbers down. The things that we are given, usually in problems, um, the gross pay that they were quoted, you know, so much per month or year. The tax table, they would look up the employer would look up from the tax table whether they're married or single, um, number of deductions or exemptions. So, you know, this will be something that we usually just get, give or you'd actually have a tax table. We'll calculate Social Security and Medicare. And we'll take a look at the rates and so forth in a little bit. The employees are actually contributing also to their health insurance. One has got life insurance. Um, we'll, we have a rate for the retirement that they have to contribute, so we'll do that. And then Anna has a charitable donation. So let's see first if these are all the withholdings that come out of the paycheck. So we're going to go gross pay less withholdings equals net pay. And that should help us then put this right up here into the journal entry. Um, so the easiest thing would be to sum all the withholdings. Um, so you can see we have federal tax, state tax, oh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? We need to get the other taxes figured. So yeah, let's do the Social Security. Um, Social Security information is right up here, 6.2% ceiling of 114. This changes, so it doesn't matter. We'll just use whatever we've got here. Um, but from year to year, it can change. So Lewis makes $4,000. $4,000. So we're going to multiply, and clearly, clearly, Lewis, this is his first month. That is all the, the pay he has. There's no previous cumulative pay. So there's no question that Lewis is below the ceiling of 114, which is a yearly type ceiling. Um, so all the his paycheck is subject to Social Security, which is 6.2%. So I'm going to multiply that times 0 0.062. Um, so we have 248 for Lewis. Okay, and then we get over to um, Anna. Her her payroll, her gross pay is ten thousand, but we need to look at Anna carefully because Anna, if you remember, had cumulative pay already. She's already paid in for Social Security on one hundred and ten thousand. The ceiling is one hundred and fourteen, so she's very close to the ceiling. Um, if you, some people are highly paid or paid enough, they get actually they don't have every bit of their payroll subject to on a Social Security. So if I take the ceiling and subtract what she's already been taxed on, it's four thousand dollars. Well her gross pay is ten, so this month only only four thousand is subject to Social Security for her. Um, so she's she's reached the ceiling. So we're gonna simply multiply that times 0 0.062. And coincidentally with this because I guess I made up the numbers, it comes out the same as what we just did for the other. But, so we have to be careful. Once you, your cumulative gets close to the ceiling, you've got to check it and make sure you need to take out. Now, Medicare has no ceiling, so that's not a problem here. Um, so if we do the Medicare, we'll have um, Tim has 4,000 gross, and the Medicare rate that we're using is 0 0.0145. So that's $58 that we'll put in for him. And then for her... We have um, 10,000 times, again, there's no ceiling, no limit, at least not at this point. And my math isn't too good right now. 10,000 times 0 0.0145. There it goes. So $145. Retirement we have up here is 1% of gross. So that should be pretty easy. We could probably do it without the calculator, but. Tim is 4,000, so we're going to multiply that times 0 0.01, which is 40. Um, and then hers is 10,000 times 0 0.01. I don't trust my zeros, so I'll do it anyway. It's 100. Okay, so we filled in the missing items where we had to do some calculations. So let's hold our breath and add up the numbers <laughs> and hope that I get the right numbers this time. So all the withholdings, there can be a ton of things, and some of them are voluntary, um, like a charitable donation or payroll deduction to your um, savings account, um, you know, whatever you happen to have. So 1,026, okay, is Tim's total withholdings. And then let's go ahead and just, easier to figure out the net pay is the only reason I'm doing that. And then, again, this little chart is not the journal entry, but it simply helps us organize the data so that we can do the journal entry. Hopefully, let's see if I can do. Okay, 2263, I think that's okay. Okay, so total withholdings compared to gross pay. Um, net pay is what the employee actually takes home. So, if we take 4000 for Tim, gross pay, minus all the deductions, 2974 looks like the net pay, and it's what we pay him, or it becomes salaries payable. And then we want to do the same thing for her, 10000 minus 2263, 7737, a lot of 7s. Okay. So that should give us the source data that we need to come over here and actually do the journal entry. Again, a giant accrued expense. 
the salaries expense and that will be the gross pays and I'm gonna to have to add, do some adding um, okay we can do this that one in our head 4,000 plus 10,000 hopefully is 14 and then your um, federal tax pay well you notice for the journal entry I don't need to do a separate journal entry for each one it can be summarized. You got all kinds of payroll records to do that. Um, over here, your federal tax is 400 plus 1500. I'm just adding these two together. So that's 1900. Or looks like it should be. Um, and I didn't indent that any. Okay, so we have federal. Hopefully, I'll have enough space in my little journal entry here. State uh, income tax payable will be um, these two, 100 plus 200 is 300. And so security tax payable. <laughs> I don't know what I did there. Obviously in the wrong spot. Um, this we probably do need to add. So, so security taxes is 248. And just because of my numbers, it came out the same. It never happened. 496. And then we have Medicare. I don't think I allowed enough spot space, but we'll fix it. Medicare tax payable. And that will be um, 58 plus 145. Okay, we're just adding them together. So 203, 203, and we have health insurance. Oops. Uh, payable or withholding, however you want to call it. Only, let's see, 150 plus 50 is 200. And we have life insurance payable, and that's going to be only 30. And I'll just go into the next box, not going to hurt anything. Um, retirement payable, it's like a pension type thing, 401k. Um, retirement payable is 40 plus 100 is 140. Donations payable um, 20. And those are all the withholdings. So the last thing we would have is cash or salaries payable. I'll put this. We did say pay the payroll, but if we weren't paying the payroll, it'd be salaries payable. And that I guess I will add. <laughs> Don't think I want to do that one in my head. So two. Um, no, I need net pay. That's right. 2974 plus 7737. 10,711. 10,711. Okay, so hopefully that would balance, <laughs> though you never know. And the impact, um, and I'm not going to put all this up here, but basically, if, it, if you're paying cash, it would be a cash outflow be an asset rather, decrease, and then you have um, a whole bunch of liabilities. So certainly your liabilities are definitely going up, and your salaries expense causes stockholders' equity to be smaller, um, your net income, your expenses lower your profit, and then of course if you do pay the payroll, you do have a cash outflow, and that's clearly going to be operated. These are your employees that you need to run the business. Okay, next let's take a look at the payroll taxes that we pay because we have these employees. So it means that the company will match um, Medicare and Social Security. Payroll tax expense. So we actually are getting the Medicare, the government's getting it from two different sources. And this is Social Security. Um, and I'll just go down a little bit further. And then we also have FUDA, which is the Federal Unemployment Taxes. So payroll is definitely a lot of detail. 
and SUDA is the state unemployment tax payable. So we've got four things going on here. Um, we'll leave the payroll tax expense blank until we get to the end. Um, the nice thing with Medicare and, and those two, I can just simply pick up the numbers. So it's 203 Medicare and 496 um, Social Security. So 203 and 496. And then we have to calculate food and SUDA. So if we come over here to our information, actually it's right there. Um, the unemployment rates that we're using and the ceiling we're using is, is given. So we're going to use 7,000 for the ceiling. The larger portion comes from the state. So I guess we contribute. They, the employer, we, that never comes out of our paycheck or hasn't yet. So 7,000, oh, wait a minute, I need to figure out. <laughs> for the employees, let's fill in the boxes first. Okay, that makes sense. So Tim just started, so our company will have to pick up the 4,000 of his gross pay. So his pay is below the ceiling. He has no cumulative pay. So this is it. So the company will be taxed this, this month and then some next month. So if we take 4,000, Whoops, I keep doing seven. 4,000 times 0 0.054 is the state. So we have 216 for the SUDA, 216. And then for federal unemployment taxes, it's 0.8%, it's less than 1%. So 4,000 times. 0.008 is $32. So usually it's a very small amount. Then I should be able to add these up maybe <laughs> if we're not maxed out for addition here. Whoops. Where'd my little guy go? Okay, so I'm, what I'm trying to do is um, add these four numbers up. So 203, Medicare, Social Security, CUDA, and SUDA. Okay, if we got the math right, it's 947. So it's easier just to wait and put in the um, total. And that has the impact of an accrued expense, which I think we have seen many times probably before, but basically it's increasing liabilities, it's reducing stockholders' equity because of retained earnings, this expense, profits go down, and that's it. <clears throat> and then fringe benefits, I'm going to squeeze in here. Um, I'm going to lump them together. But it says here in our little footnote that the company actually matches what the employee contributes for retirement savings and health insurance. Um, so, yeah, I think I can, I'll do um, retirement expense. Payable, and I'll just come into that. It's okay. And the other one was health insurance. I think health insurance expense and health insurance payable. Okay. And this is matching what the employees are putting in. tell you what, I'm going to take life insurance to not be a match. We'll just do health insurance and retirement savings. Which I should put that there. Okay, change my footnote. <laughs> so, if we look at what we had up here, and there could be other things. It could be vacation pay. I just didn't choose to add that to our example. So, um, retirement, we've already done up here someplace. Um, hopefully, 140. So we're going to, the company will also contribute to their retirement, and the company will also contribute to the health insurance, which is 200. Okay. 200. Whoops. <laughs> 200 and 200. Okay. These are also accrued expenses, so it's the same impact as the payroll taxes, so I'm not going to show that. So now we're down to paying the note that matures. Remember, this is actually a note that um, 
was taken out this period. I think it was taken out on the December 1st up here. Um, or not. Here it is, December 11th it was taken out. So it's a 20-day note. Okay, so it's taken out and maturing, so it makes life a little easier. <clears throat> we can uh, simply take off notes payable. So we're going to reduce notes payable. We're going to recognize the interest for the month. And so I won't do it as a two-step process. We'll just do it like that. And we'll have cash. Okay, so notes payable, I think we'd all agree. Um, I guess just ignore the health insurance. Um, $1,800 principal. Um, the interest we should be able to figure out is $1,800 times 20 days, all fitting into this period so it makes it a little easier. 20 divided by 360. That would be for a full 20 days, and that's what we have. So does that look all right? That's right, it's 10%, so I guess it was 1,800 times, let me do it again, 10% times 20 over 360. So it's 10. Okay, I didn't go quite far enough. So $10 interest, and so you're paying principal and interest. And with this entry, your um, assets go down by 1,800, or 1,810. Your liabilities go down by 1800 and then the interest, of course, is a retained earnings account. So retained earnings goes down by 10 um, Your profits would go down by your interest. And then the cash flow has to be split. Whoops. <laughs> cash flow, the cash for interest would be operating and the cash flow from the principal would be financing. Okay, so I think that's everything. So the last thing we're going to do is the adjusting entries. We're going to accrue interest on a couple loans. Um, and so it's once again a lot of accrued expenses. Um, so we want to be, for matching purposes, show the cost of the loan in the current period. And um, so it, timing, again, is very important in accounting. So the first one, accruing interest on a one-year loan, um, here we can just deal with the, the time can be so many months over 12. So we're looking at a monthly adjustment, so one month over 12. So the principal of 12,000 times the interest rate times 1 divided by 12. So it's $50. I don't have to count days for this one because it's, it's a yearly note. Um, the second one, I do have to count days. So we have 31 days in December. It was taken out the 6th, so you don't count the first day. That's 25 days of the 60 days needs to be accrued. So if we do principal, which I'm thinking of the other principal, $800 times 0.06, which is an annual rate, times, we said 25, right? 25 over 360. It doesn't come out evenly, so we're just going to round it to the nearest cent. 333? $3.33. <laughs> $3 um, we've done accrued expenses before, um, just like we have up here with payroll. We see liabilities going up, stockholders' equity going down and net income going down. So I'm not going to repeat the impacts for those. And then we accrue the warranties, which is again an accrued expense. So warranty expense, whoops, where'd it go? <laughs> warranty payable, there it is. And it's $800. Okay, so what that does again for matching is time the expense in the same period as the revenue. When you repair, we saw you go against the payable. You don't expense it when you repair it. And then last but not least, we've got some contingent liabilities. Uh, contingent liabilities, again, either footnoted, do nothing, or journalize. 
So the first one we have here is that there's penalty and fines that are being processed against us from the government, but it has not been to the point where we definitely have a bill and it's there. However, it looks very likely that we will lose something, we will have to pay something. Um, it's an amount that will be clearly material and we can project how much it is. It's going to be between a million dollars and 1.2 million. So we're going to use the million dollars go in the low end. We don't want to overdo the loss. And I'll simply move it over a little bit so you can see it. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it's a big number. Oh, it's showing the cents. Okay. And um, for an accrued liability, we have an estimated loss for some type of expense account is fine and a payable, in this case it would be payable to government I guess. And it's again, it's an accrued expense, it has the same impact as the accrued warranties and the accrued payroll and so forth. Um, so I won't repeat that, but if you go back to the payroll one, liabilities go up, stockholders equity goes down, net income goes down. Okay, next we have um, a lawsuit that's going against us, but our attorneys are the ones that make the judgment call and they say it's reasonably possible that we're going to lose. So it's not probable. Probable is like 80, 90 percent or some high percentage. Reasonably possible, yeah, it could happen, but that's not good enough to actually make a journal entry. Also, we cannot estimate it. So this would be footnoted um, and would not be journalized. And then the last one we have is um, there's a remote chance there will be damages to our company property from an earthquake. Okay, the term remote tells us not likely. Um, we don't know anything about it, so therefore nothing needs to be done, not even a footnote. But I'll write footnote in this other one just to remind us. So those are the three possibilities with contingent liabilities. Hopefully you are current liability doubt. <laughs> so this is the end of the, this particular clip.